Well, welcome back everyone to the final session of this year's commissioning show and what a session it's going to be because we're going to try and answer the question, what do CCGs need to do to avoid major reorganization I'll say it again, major reorganization in three years' time. Now, uh, as you will all well know, the NHS is completely addicted to reorganization every two or three years. Um, clearly, to some politicians, I'm sure not to Stephen, it seems to be a way of proving your might and power, but uh, too often with the reorganizations, we organize the deck chairs, but without necessarily making it different for patients. Only yesterday, uh, Andy Burnham was on this stage saying that he wanted to hand the budgets from clinical commissioning groups to health and well-being boards. Uh, he said this was not going to be a major reorganization. I'm not sure quite how you do that, but uh, maybe there is a way. Um, and we also know that clinical commissioning groups have many enemies. They have the status quo on the outside, the vested interests of various uh, professional bodies and various organizations, all hoping that things will return to normal and clinical commission groups will go away. And on the inside, uh, the, some of the clinicians who don't feel up for it, don't want to be part of it, feel it's a bridge too far in their professional careers. So uh, will clinical commissioning groups survive or not? That's a big question and a very big question to ask when they've only been live now for a couple of months. But as we all know, an election is now less than two years ago, so it is a pertinent question. And I wanted, before introducing our panel that are going to give us some hints on how they can survive, I wanted to ask you, the audience, what your view is. So we're going to go on to a question, if you can get your keypads ready. And the question is, how much do you understand about what do CCGs need to do to avoid major reorganization in three years' time? Nothing, a little, you have a good understanding, or a lot. So, let's see how the audience answers that question. Uh, so, fingers on buzzers, and I'll just give you five seconds. One, two, three, four, five. Right. So, you understand a little. Not many would say they've got good understanding, but not that many know nothing. So that's probably a very reasonable position to be in with uh, just two months into clinical commissioning groups. Um, so uh, now this is the, the real essay question. Do you think CCGs will undergo major or, or, or reorganization in the next five years? Do you think it's very likely, quite likely, possibly, quite unlikely, or very unlikely? You've got five seconds to answer that question. One, two, three, four, Five. Ah, right. Not <laughs> percent saying very unlikely. Goodness, you are a cynical lot. Um, uh, let's see if our panel can reassure us uh, that the 54%, well, actually, the uh, almost 80% of you who think it's pretty likely uh, are wrong. So, na next, it's a great pleasure to introduce a very talented panel. I said this morning that I felt inadequate at the end of yesterday evening's surgery with all the tasks and all the suffering and so little to offer my patients against it. I feel even more inadequate this afternoon with these big cheeses standing to my right. The first of which is Stephen Dorrell, who is chair of the Health Select Committee. Uh, he went to Brasenose College, Oxford, uh, just opposite my own college, and he and I will be one of the few people that remember that the only way to see a girl after nine o'clock was to scale ten-foot walls. Um, he's done a bit more since then. He was Secretary of State, um, and actually we owe Stephen, um, and he probably remembers this, we owe Stephen the existence of clinical commissioning groups today, because Stephen not only uh, was the minister uh, responsible for introducing fund holding, but he was also um, the launcher of the locality commissioning pilots, which are probably as close to CCGs today as any model we've had so far. Our second uh, panelist is David Bennett, um, who has achieved what I've been unable to achieve in spite of being 18 years annually elected uh, chair of NHS Alliance, 
uh, uh, David, David has gone even further because he's not only the chief executive of Monitor, he's also its chair. So David Bennett is Monitor. And he was also advisor to Tony Blair, so he's a man who knows what goes on in the back of politicians' minds. Uh, David Haslam, our third panelist, is a GP. He's also been a chair of the Royal College of General Practitioners. That was in the years before Royal Colleges started declaring war on governments. Uh, but today, he is the chair of NICE, the National Institute for Clinical Excellence, and giving it a very high profile in primary care. Robert Naylor will be well known to all of you as the chief exec of University College Finan uh, Foundation Trust, a, a trust that really leads the world in terms of hospital care. And it'll be interesting, I think, to know from David whether he thinks CCG should survive. And then finally, Ben Page, the, uh, the king of pollsters, uh, who is chief executive of Ipsos Mori, who has produced such interesting uh, studies on some of the rather contradictory expectations of our patients. So we've got an absolutely star-studded panel, and I'm going to ask each of them to tell us exactly how CCGs are going to survive the next three years, and working along, starting with Stephen Dorrell. So first, over to you, Stephen. Well, thank you very much. Michael, you said that the NHS was addicted to management reorganization. I suspect most people in the NHS would resist that proposition and say it isn't the NHS that's addicted uh, to management reorganization, it's politicians that are addicted uh, to management reorganization. And I think in understanding that, uh, you understand uh, the answer to the question how, you, how the present set of structures uh, can secure their uh, a, a, a consistent evolution. I think almost nobody would say that they should pr prevail forever in exactly their current form. Most of us would want to see them evolve uh, rather than the uh, plant being torn up again in order that we can examine its still very young roots. And I think the answer to the question how you secure uh, coherent, consistent evolution uh, rather than another re-disorganization, as it was uh, once described, uh, the answer to that question is that you create facts on the ground. You demonstrate in a local health economy uh, that in the set of, the set of uh, policy challenges that face uh, the particular local health economy in which you work, uh, those challenges are being addressed by the combination of uh, institutions that the new legislation creates. I don't think that CCGs will, will, will uh, survive in, in the long term unless they use health and well-being boards as agencies for promoting service integration. Because we have to come back from the discussion about institutions and look at what it is we're trying to do. We all use the rhetoric about needing to deliver more joined up services, better integration, within the National Health Service and between the National Health Service and social care, and I would always include social housing in that piece as well, uh, what we need to do is to evolve the existing set of institutions uh, now being legislated uh, so that they are fit for purpose for delivering the kind of service that we want to see. It's a, it, the mistake, in my view, in the legislation was to discuss form rather than function. Form should follow function. We know we want to deliver, need to deliver, from the interests of our patients. We need to deliver more joined up services. And so uh, my, the, 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 the core of the answer to the question is create facts on the ground. And there's nothing unusual in that in politics. A piece of legislation earns its uh, right to, to continue in the long term by demonstrating that it has the capacity within it to solve problems. Quite often, not precisely in the way that the original proponents of the legislation envisaged, I think that part of this legislation that in the end will make the biggest long-term difference is the Health and Wellbeing Board. And the challenge for the CCGs is to use it to deliver the more integrated services that we often talk about but so seldom deliver. Well, th thanks, Stephen. Extraordinary in two respects. Firstly, a politician that keeps to his three minutes. 
and secondly, a politician that says that form should follow function. Over to you, David. I think I'm grateful I'm at this end of the, uh, of the lineup here because I, I suspect we're all going to say somewhat similar things. I had a four-word answer to the question, actually, but I think it's essentially a four-word summary of what Stephen said, which is, do a good job. Um, I think that's the fundamental. Um, it's difficult to argue to change something if it seems to be working. And I think, in particular, um, uh, doing a good job which the users of the service, the patients of the NHS, would recognize as having improved things. I mean, that's a critical test. It will be difficult, I think, to argue for change if the public at large are saying, well, this is working. We are seeing some things changing here for the better. So um, that's my sort of simple answer. I suppose a slightly more sophisticate, sophisticated way of answering it would be to say, well, what are the things that people are looking for that, that might incline them to change things again? Now, again, Stephen's touched on um, uh, at least one of those. Uh, for certain, um, I think everyone's looking for better integration of the delivery of care, and particularly, uh, as Stephen says, better integration between health and social care. So I would say, as I dug under that, that uh, simple answer, um, one of the ways in which um, it would be important to do a good job would be to, walk, to work um, effectively uh, with um, local authorities through the health and well-being boards uh, to deliver better joined up care uh, in each of your local communities. Um, the one other thing I would highlight, which I think could be a source of pressure on the system as it's now set up, is, is whether or not the system is capable of taking the right sort of strategic perspective for how the provider landscape needs to develop. And a criticism that you could make is that we've gone from 152 PCTs, which most people thought was too many, to 211 CCGs. So I think the other thing I would uh, suggest you might do uh, to avoid uh, immediate reorganization is to work together, as well as working with health and well-being boards, but working together to take that strategic and indeed I'd argue proactive strategic perspective on how your health economies need to develop to start this uh, or to drive faster this um, process of change which is absolutely needed. Well thank, thank you very much David. Uh, working together, working with health and wellbeing boards and doing a good job. Over to other David. Yeah, well thank you Mike. Um, I think, as we all know, reorganization isn't just a simple consequence of uh, an organization not getting things right. It's more often, as, as we all know, driven by this political need for something to be done. Um, and as GPs, I think every GP here has been faced by patients saying something must be done when actually we know the right thing to do is absolutely nothing at all. Um, and in an ideal world, uh, the advice would be that you'd avoid reorganization by avoiding the mistakes of your predecessors. Uh, the problem is that most reorganization seems to have been driven by impatience rather than by mistakes, uh, and it, which makes it much harder for those uh, in organizations, like Mike said or like Stephen said about you know, the, the, the problem of pulling up uh, the plant to look to check the roots are all right means you keep damaging it. Um, so it's, ha it's hard to avoid making mistakes if mistakes weren't the reason you were reorganized. Um, but I think the key problem that health policies, uh, the key problem is that health policies take quite a long time to impact, to demonstrate be benefits. But politics has a much shorter time frame. We can but hope that the intention of the Health and Social Care Act and bill was to depoliticize uh, health policy. Uh, I think most of us will believe that when we see it. Um, it's wishful thinking. So the key, the absolute key, I think, is to minimize controversy by working closely with patients and the public. Those who were here in the previous session uh, heard about commissioning, which really, really involves patients. And the catch-22, of course, is that the big necessary decisions will probably be the most controversial ones. So I think it's vital, and I've always found when I've been chairing pieces of work which are controversial and difficult, that you have to focus on the values of everyone in the organization. And if we focus on the values of the patients and the members of the population, rather than the medical and social tribes, then we're much, much more likely to get it right. Um, and finally, I would say this, wouldn't I? As money is tight, we have to do what works, and, if it, and not what doesn't work. 
And if you want to do what works, then that's what nice is for. <laughs> <laughs> a nice advert at the end, David. Um, so we need to work with patients and the public, and we need to carry our values. Robert, your views. <clears throat> well, firstly, I'm proud to say I've been in the health service all my life and a chief executive of a teaching hospital for uh, just on 30 years. So I've seen every reorganization um, in the health service uh, since 1974, and I've lost count of how many there have been. They seem to occur every five years uh, and uncannily uh, almost aligned to those of the electoral cycle. So I think there's one thing that we can be pretty certain about um, in life and death, and that is that there will be a further reorganization of the health service, certainly within the next five years. Um, I think history tells us that. Um, I think commissioning's always been, a, from a provider perspective, commissioning's always been a great challenge and often criticized. And I think um, potentially CCGs have been um, handed a poison chalice. Um, the purchaser and provider split, which has been in existence now for well over a decade, um, has, uh, is a feature of virtually every westernized healthcare system. And I don't think it's going to disappear anytime soon, despite some of the tweets and reports I've heard coming out of uh, this conference. The existence of payment by results for an organization like mine is absolutely essential. I remember when I was first a chief executive, my, uh, 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 the, the chief executive of my local health authority, who was then effectively the commissioner, used to say to me at the beginning of, beginning of every year, here's a bundle of money, do the best you can with it, Robert. Now, I hope that we're not going to return to those kind of days, and I'm sure that view will be echoed by uh, all of my colleagues on the provider side. I think the, um, the market that has developed, uh, the quasi-market that has developed in healthcare, uh, at least has uh, allowed us to measure performance and enable patients to uh, exercise much greater choice and to a significant extent rewarded those organizations that have really focused on the things that are absolutely vital to patients and that's quality, outcomes and experience. So having accepted the challenge of CCGs, albeit with some reluctance, um, I think it's a very daunting agenda. Um, providers have been playing at this game for a long time, um, and the recent uh, uh, changes uh, following the uh, Health and Social Care Bill uh, really has resulted in shuffling the deck chairs around much of the health service, but the provider side has been left pretty much on our own. So we're in a, a relatively strong position, and entering into uh, uh, contract, negotiations, contract negotiations this year with CCGs and indeed with specialist commissioners, uh, uh, has resulted certainly in my organization not signing one contract yet. And we're now three months into the year, and it looks like it's going to be some way away before we're going to do that. So we're really in quite a, a difficult situation. But to be realistic, uh, Rome wasn't built in a day, and we need to learn to walk before we can run. So I think some of the signs are really good. In particular, the relationships that we have with CCGs in, uh, in North London are are really good and I'm, I'm greatly encouraged by the emphasis on developing integrated systems, something I've been a long, uh, a long supporter of, but I think we have to be systemic about it rather than what I call fiddling around the margins uh, of small groups of patients. Uh, I think we need to be much more ambitious and we have, we have a long way to go, particularly in, in this inner city areas uh, where there needs to be a massive uh, investment in primary care, infrastructure and people and also on the provider side, uh, some quite radical restructuring of hospital services because there are clearly far too many hospitals doing far too many things and many of those things are out of the competence of hospitals that don't have highly specialized services. So working together between CCGs and, uh, and providers is, uh, is absolutely essential. Um, prior to the last election, I had the privilege of going to see David Cameron before he was Prime Minister and there were, there were six things we said to try and help him develop his manifesto and the most important thing we said is that the future is about integration. It's about working in partnership and collaboration. Uh, I don't think necessarily that was the political view at the time but it's certainly changed since then. So I think the one big thing that CCGs need to do is to grasp the nettle of integration in a, in a systemic way. Uh, be bold about it and I'm very supportive of many of the integrated care systems that we see in other countries, particularly in America like Geisinger and Kaiser Permanente and we all need to we all need to play our part in that, particularly in urban areas like London, where uh, there are, are huge benefits to be gained uh, by, by working uh, in collaboration. I guess the final thing I'd say is that I am not a supporter 
of transferring budgets to local authorities, um, as some have suggested. Um, I'm a, I'm, I'm, it's a great privilege and I'm very proud to be part of the NHS. And if we're going to keep the N in the NHS, then I think we need to be very, very careful what we do about the money. Um, so in summary, I think this is a really, uh, really exciting agenda. I think it's a really uh, daunting agenda for uh, CCGs. It's no mean task, but we all have to play this game together. Well, thanks, thanks Robert. Um, Robert, just so we know who's going to win the next election, who are you advising at the present? Uh, as many and as often as I can. <laughs> um, ben. Okay, well, I'll, I'll finish up with a light-hearted um, uh, examination of this. I think the first thing that, uh, if you're a CCG, uh, or if you're, you, know, you like CCGs, then the first thing is obviously to campaign for uh, the re-election of David Cameron on the basis that, at least if we keep, in theory, the same government, um, the chances of a new government wanting to change things are somewhat lessened. I'm not saying that the Conservatives have a huge chance of uh, winning the next general election, but you really don't want the government to change too often. Changes in Secretary of State alone within the same government are quite capable of changing direction radically, So, but at least try and keep the government. Um, the point has already been made and can't be emphasised enough. Um, be competent, but in particular avoid the Daily Mail and media crises. Um, so far, despite considerable efforts by the government, uh, to make people very excited about the NHS and even people in, employed by NHS England declaring that care offered by the NHS is actually inhuman, uh, the public has paid no attention whatsoever and its current level of awareness of what the government is planning or indeed CCGs is about as high as, as they were of labour reforms um, seven or eight years ago. Uh, so you, you really don't want to change that too much. Um, patient satisfaction levels remain high so you don't want to have any, any sort of any crises or, wonder, or people starting to wonder if these reforms which they're not hugely enthusiastic about when they learn about them are actually making things worse. The other thing, if you are a CCG, is not to do anything too radically different from your neighbours, and in particular not to let the Daily Mail find out about it if you do. Um, so you mustn't be seen to be offering something wonderful that your neighbours don't offer, because this may again cause scandal and interest um, and uh, perceived unfairness, or the end of the N in the NHS, which one of the things that we do know about it and isn't going to change, whatever happens to the structures in the NHS, um, you know, it is, it is the closest thing we have to a religion in this country and the majority of people in this country say that they do not want people to be allowed to have something in one part of the country um, uh, in, the, in another part of the country, even, so, even though they simultaneously believe that um, services should be much more locally determined. Um, so the majority, you know, they, you know, you cannot have X in John O'Groats if it is not also available in Land's End. Um, that's very, very important to them. Um, another point that's already been made, but I think, again, I would just put a, a small spin on that. Make huge friends with your local authority. Um, you know, the, the well-being board is your best mate. Uh, the social care are your great friends. And I think one of the things that local government can show the NHS is that, and in a way, local government's been spared, um, partly because it has elected local politicians, which the national parties need to keep sweet, so they go and knock on doors for them at election time. Local government has been spared um, some of the top-down reorganisations that se uh, central government has inflicted on the NHS. But what it has been doing, uh, and you know, in fairness to the to the government, they've you know they've tried to avoid those top-down things, is much more local experimentation, partnerships, etc., of all kinds. And I think that's clearly as you know, as we grope towards some better integration, it will be it will be trying to get those things working rather than some, waiting for some one-size-fits-all cookie-cutter model that does the integration of social care. Um, must be really, really important. But overall, I'd just say avoid the Daily Mail. Thank you. Well, can we thank all our panellists? Um, and uh, so we've got some really interesting views here, haven't we? Um, uh, ben saying perhaps we should keep our noses clean and blend with the wallpaper and all will be well. Um, actually, Ben, can I ask you, do you think the public understand CCGs any better than they understood PCTs? Which is the more uh, visible no, to got, them? They, you know, they've got no idea. I mean, no, it's, you know, just tw so, only 29% of the public even claim to know that uh, major reforms of the NHS are, are underway. Yes. Most of them don't even claim to, you know, say they don't know anything about it. And if you were in the position of the commissioners or the commissioning organisation representatives, how would you best make them aware? 
well, you, you are going to need to engage with your local, you know, your local community. But again, you need to think of the, the amount of effort. Uh, some, it's the same with foundation trusts and the idea that you know, the sit local citizenry are all going to be active participants in this institution. The amount of effort that is necessary to get that raised awareness, that level of awareness, is vast. Some are obviously engaged with the activist groups, the patient groups, the groups of people representing long-term conditions, the parish councillors, all of the activist community. But be realistic, I would say, about your ambition that every Tom, Dick and Harry in your neighbourhood is actually going to know about you, because right. most people have got better things to do. Right. Right, David. Well, th there's a fascinating catch-22 in all this, isn't there? In that if things are different from area to area, then there's a problem. And if they aren't different, the whole thing's a waste of time. So, so it's really a quite tricky one to, un to unpick. The, 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 the way you can unpick it is by saying it's the standards that need to be the same everywhere. How you deliver them is going to vary. But, but, but there can't be significant differences in the standards. Stephen, well, there can't be dif significant differences in the ambition, but it is, of course, the untold secret of the health service that it doesn't deliver the same outcomes and the same services in every part of the country. Uh, and one of the challenges which CCGs working with Health and Wellbeing Board should be addressing is working out how, in the particular circumstances of your local health economy, you can narrow the gap when there's areas of, of service in your area that don't match, that don't compare favorably with services delivered elsewhere. We all, I agree with Robert that the public does support the end of the NHS, but what they don't understand is the very wide ver ver uh, variation of outcome and variation of quality of service that exists within the service. And if we can make real progress towards closing those gaps, then we shall, go back to my phrase at the beginning, have created facts on the ground that justify the new entities. One other thought, Michael. I wouldn't waste time trying to raise awareness of the public about the new structures for the management of the health service. They know about the health service. They care deeply about the health service. They care about the function but they don't, they don't, frankly, care about the form. And St Stephen, going back to health and wellbeing boards, and I think we'd all agree there's a very really important relationship there, would you be in favour of CCGs handing their budgets over to health and wellbeing boards? Uh, no, I wouldn't, for the, uh, partly for the reason that Robert gave, that there is an N in NHS. Uh, there's also a straightforward formalistic point uh, that the budget of the National Health Service is voted through the Treasury, through Parliament. It is a national budget and there will always be national accountability uh, around the way the money is spent within the NHS. So I don't think uh, that simply passing it to health and wellbeing boards and saying this is all now a bit dealt with by local government, I don't think that works for any number of reasons. Uh, but I think, if I may say so, when David Bennett was in front of the Health Committee yesterday, we were asking him about this old debate between national and local within the health service. The truth is, it's never been entirely national and can never be entirely local. Uh, there has to be a proper balance between the national viewpoint and the local viewpoint. I think it's been too centralised and in the past. I do think stronger links with health and well-being boards with local democratic electorates. I do think that's an important opportunity uh, in, this, uh, in these changes. So change the balance, but don't imagine that you're going from one end of the spectrum to the other. What we're seeking to do is to strengthen local accountability. Why are we wanting to do that? We argue it's good in its own terms, but actually the, the real benefit that comes from greater engagement with local communities is that it's the means by which you create permission to make the changes which is the way by which uh, these institutions will justify themselves. They'll justify themselves if they deliver a faster rate of change in the care model, more integrated care, and you won't do that without engaging local communities. Right. Well, th well, thanks. And we're going to come, come to the floor shortly. I just want to make one last challenge to Robert Naylor. Um, Robert, um, uh, payment by results, which you uh, spoke highly of just now, um, has generated quite huge surpluses for some hospital trusts. We won't ask you what your hospital trust surplus is, but you, if you want to tell us, we'd be very interested to hear. 
I got the impression that you felt CCGs were more challenging to you as Commissioner than the PCTs had been. Is that right? Uh, well, I don't think they are yet, but I think, I think they could well be. Um, uh, as far as surpluses are concerned, well, um, if you run a business, and that's really what a foundation trust is, running a high-quality business for the benefit of our customers, our patients, um, then you have to have some cash to pay the wages. So <clears throat> you, can't, uh, you can't just run the business uh, on a shoestring. Um, so you have to create a surplus to, to enable uh, uh, the business to operate effectively. And you also have to create a surplus to enable you to invest in new facilities. You can't just spend all the money every year. When the equipment breaks down or the building needs to be replaced, well, if there's no money there to replace it, then you're going to end up with what happens in many hospitals, and that is uh, sort of derelict environments with, 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 with old equipment. If you want modern facilities, which is clearly what you want, what we want, and what the public want, uh, with the latest technology uh, to be able to treat the more, more complex conditions, then you have to, you have to make a surplus to, uh, to generate cash. Now, we are known as an organization that has a lot of cash, but that's because we spend a lot of money on new investment. Our, forward-looking capital investment plans over the next decade run into about a billion pounds. We're going to spend 150 million pounds on one piece of equipment to create a national center for proton beam therapy, a new type of cancer treatment. Um, now, you can't do these kind of things if you don't make a surplus. So um, I think the system works fairly well for us. We're regulated very closely by David and his colleagues to make sure that the surpluses that we have are properly invested back in patient care. We're a not-for-profit organization, so there's no point in making a profit other than in reinvesting it back in improving the quality of care we provide to your patients and our patients. Well, yes, and I, although I suspect some primary care would say that's a very strong argument, but one of the problems and one of the outcomes of this is that primary care investment has gone down proportionately over the last 10 years. Um, but let's throw it open. To, I see a CCG leader putting his hand up. Um, can we give him the microphone for a challenge? And anyone else pop your hands up and we'll over yeah, there. Well, Howard Stokes, uh, a chair of Bexley CCG and a former member of the Health Select Committee, as, as it happens. I mean, a quick one comment on payment by results. That is that's absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with results. And I would much rather commission for outcomes rather than for, for activity. That's the first point. The second point I want to make, which is a much more wider point, what characterises CCGs, and the reason I've wanted to be a chair of a CCG is because it honestly embraces clinical leadership. None of the panel actually mentioned clinical leadership, and I wonder if we could have a comment from the panel on, on what you th see as the strengths and weaknesses of clinical leadership, and whether that model is something that is sustainable. David Bennett? I think clinical leadership is very important. In fact, um, I think Robert offers a very a good example of what strong cl clinical leadership in uh, the provider setting can do. Uh, so I, I think the move to stronger clinical leadership on the commissioning side is also a, a move in the right direction. I think we have to encourage more clinicians to take on leadership roles. Ben, what do, P, what do the public think of clinical leadership? Yeah, you know, well, they love, they love them to bits and these people walk on water. So, I mean, the challenge for, all, you know, for people like the BMA or for, for, for clinicians generally, of course, is when they then start getting associated with more difficult decisions rather than just people who hand out wonder, wonderment. Um, I think what, what we notice in our, work, in our work with clinicians, which we're, you know, we're doing, looking at how people are reacting to new, new demands on them, new expectations on them, is that you are going to see this separation. A lot of people want to stick to the knitting. It's a bit, it's a bit like in teaching. Most teachers just never want to be he a head teacher. They look at them and I don't know if they see them reaching for the gin every night, but 90% of you know, teachers just say, I just don't want to. And I think that's something that we'll need to, to look at. And I, you know, we, we have the Leadership Academy, but how do, we, how do we get people to be ready to take those, take those responsibilities? Because I suspect that more of them would be good at it than, than we'll think they are. And though the minority that are really keen may not always be the ones you want to do it. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. I remember the best way to irritate a minister was to forget to take the stethoscope out of your jacket pocket when you came up to London to see them. It was a sort of unfair googly. Stephen, do you feel that uh, uh, clinicians unfairly use their status? Uh, sometimes, but uh, I, I think I see clinical engagement in the commissioning process, as Howard quite rightly says. It's one of the uh, value adds that comes in the new structures and I think it's a necessary part of what I was uh, mentioning earlier 
uh, the requirement to create permission for change. We've been talking about what used to be called purchasing, what these days is called commissioning in the health service for over 20 years now. Uh, why hasn't it worked? Uh, why hasn't it achieved? the rate of change that's necessary to ensure that the care model is kept up to date. Well, one of the reasons, I think, is that it's been experienced by clinicians as something done to them by managers. Uh, and the, the uh, value add that comes from an active clinical commissioning group is that it creates the forum in which the clinical community in a particular locality can ask the questions I was referring to earlier about outcomes achieved and standards delivered in that particular locality. And it isn't managers producing statistics produced from the Department of Health. It's clinicians in a locality that know these uncomfortable truths uh, and have now greater authority to surface the truth and do something about it. David. Well, two, two or three points on this. The first is the, the evidence is pretty clear that good clinical leadership really does deliver uh, international leadership from things like Kaiser, whether, whether you're interested in American health policy or not, the evidence is clear that clinical leadership makes a difference. Part of this, is, I think, is because clinicians tend to trust other clinicians uh, and so listen to them. Uh, there's an awful flip side to this, which is this terrible, terrible business of accusing one's uh, colleagues who get into management roles as going over to the dark side, something that I always stamp on when I hear it. It irritates me intensely. I think a critical part of medical careers is going to be being involved in this. Not for, not for everyone, but for lots of people. The second thing I feel really strongly is clinical skills are fantastically useful in leadership. I have found my skills as a GP incredibly helpful when dealing, for instance, with ministers. You go into the, the consultation and you explore their ideas, their concerns, their expectations, exactly the same things you would do with a patient. It gives you a real benefit of working through that. That's not, that's not magic, it's just something that we all, we all do. But the, the really critical thing at the moment is time. Every GP, every practice I meet is exhausted. They just feel to be really running on a hamster wheel at the moment. And to get the time, the time to be able to think to plan, to develop. People who've come to a conference like this, thank God you're here, you know, that's fantastic. Um, but I see so many practices where they're just running to stand still, and standing still isn't the way we're gonna get forward. It's true, true, David. I mean, with, with ministers, they often want a free consultation as well, don't they? I think uh, on two yes. occasions, they've rolled up their trouser leg to show me a knee. None have taken down their trousers yet, but that will happen. Um, let's <laughs> ask the last, last two questionnaires. We'll have them both at the same time. So first over there. Anne-Marie Holder, uh, GP clinical lead for Stafford and Surround CCG. Uh, I'd like to ask the panel if I could, if they could perhaps look into their crystal balls and uh, perhaps give me a prediction about the reputation of the GP uh, as a doctor in the future. A little concern because obviously we're putting our heads above the parapet and I suppose this follows on from the point about clinical leadership. Do you think we're going to escape with our reputations unscathed by the end of this? But very good question. We're going to ask all the panel for 30 seconds answer to the last two questions. So the very last question over there. I think uh, the, I'm Dr. Bose. I'm the clinical lead from Tharak NHS CCG. Uh, I agree with the panel, but we are trying a very different approach. So we are, we've, we've gone for the collaborative working uh, which means the health and health and well-being board. We've got the secondary care. We've got the primary care. We also involve the GP with special interest in primary care. And above that, we have involved the health watch and the patient federation in making all decisions. We've gone further, and we're exploring that we do tell our patient federation that we understand your rights, we preserve your rights, but we are training them to understand their responsibilities. I can. That is the only thing uh, that would work, I suppose, the collaboration. Right. So where do GPs uh, stand in future and collaboration? Let's go down the line, starting with Stephen. 30 seconds each. Crikey. Uh, two questions. In many ways, they're similar, aren't they? Uh, because they both address uh, the future relationship between a, gen a, a general practitioner and their patients. And I think one of the unasked questions as this legislation went through is what general practice itself will look like 
uh, five or ten years out. Uh, it's one of the things I did when I was Secretary of State was to try to join up the commissioning process for primary and secondary care because if what we're seeking to do is to create pathways of care uh, that engage uh, general practice but presumably engage the rest of primary care as well. Too often primary care is taken to be a synonym for general practice. It isn't. Uh, so what does future primary care look like? What does the role general practice plays in that primary community-based care as well as the relationships between that and the rest of the system? Those seem to me to be some of the most interesting uh, questions which need to be addressed and to the lady who asked uh, will general practice emerge from this process with its uh, reputation intact uh, my answer to that is only if general practice like the rest of health and care demonstrates that it's willing to see practice change because that's the only answer actually to David Haslam's point about the hamster wheel uh, is not to simply go on doing what we do now uh, but to rethink how we meet the needs of today's patients more effectively. So I, I interpret you saying, Stephen, if we stand still, we're, we're lost, we can only go forward and we've got to change. Really important message for the, for, for, for the GP community, I think. David, yes, last well, words. Um, the, um, on the collaboration front, I, I think essentially, in a way, it's, it's, it's almost a theme of the uh, response that's needed, I think, to the reforms. Interestingly, lots of people argued that one of the problems with the reforms is that they were fragmenting the system in some ways. They, they have to a degree. Curiously, but, but very encouragingly, I think the very fear of that fragmentation is leading people to talk more about collaboration, even do more of it, than, um, than they were doing before. Um, we all know that um, uh, collaboration within organizations uh, can be very poor. Um, so creating more organizations doesn't necessarily create worse um, collaboration. So I, I, I think it's an important theme and, and perversely it may even get better as a result of uh, breaking things up. On the, um, on the GP's reputation front, well in a way I, I think if I were you I'd take solace from uh, Ben Page's earlier comments. Um, I think the GP's reputation, at least in terms of how the public at large feel about you, uh, is going to be determined as it has been up to now by what goes on in your surgeries. Carry on doing that well, and I think you're OK. Thanks. David, 30 Abs seconds. Ab absolutely agree with that last point. Since time immemorial, people have needed a fellow human being that they can turn to and trust at a time of, of need and when they're frightened and scared. Uh, and I don't think that fundamental human need is going to change. I think the need to be able to trust people and trust someone. GPs remain the most trusted people in, in society. Uh, we'll retain that as long as we deserve to, and we'll deserve to as long as we're on the side of the patients and not on the side of our own particular tribes, which is where the integration and changing the way we work comes, comes forward. I'm absolutely certain we cannot go on as we are with people working harder and harder and harder, faster and faster and faster. It just, it's not sustainable. So finding uh, a new way of working between primary and secondary and social care that's on the side of the patients and do it for the patients and they'll trust us. Thank you, Dave. And ultimately, Robert? <clears throat> well, you don't need me to tell you that the public love the NHS and they love the GPs even more than the NHS. Uh, but I think the current uh, changes uh, could well undermine that uh, to, to respond to the first question. I think there were two reasons why that could happen. <clears throat> I think first, first of all, uh, as Ben has said, the Daily Mail is going to be interested in stories from patients where they think that the GPs are denying them services because they have some kind of financial interest in doing so. I think that's a potentially huge damaging thing. I don't think we've learned the lessons from the failure of GP fund holding back in the 1990s. I mean, we need to go back and understand why uh, the public lost a lot of confidence in GP fund holding because there was a financial incentive uh, to those GPs that held the budgets. Uh, and I think secondarily, because GPs are going to increasingly become m part of the most difficult decisions, and they're going to be the decisions about what happens to their local hospitals. Uh, there have to be massive changes in the provision of secondary health care, in the same way that I said earlier on, changes have to occur in primary care. And the GPs, if they're not careful, are going to be seen through the CCGs as being, um, as being part of that uh, uh, part of that decision-making process. 
Whereas in the past, they've been able to hide away from that uh, as if they got clean hands and it had nothing to do with them. So I think those are two warning signs, and therefore I think there is a, there is a chance that uh, at the end of this, the reputation of primary care might be tarnished. And it's in all of our interests, ours and yours, to make sure it doesn't happen. Thank you, Robert. And then finally, Ben. Well, I'd one of the few verities of opinion polling is the trust in GPs, and it's, we started asking this in the early 1980s. The figures have barely changed any year we've asked it. So I'm not expecting it to change, but on a slightly different note to the ones that have just been raised, I'd, I'd like it to change a bit, because I think I'd like, to, I'd like people to still love and trust their GP as much as ever, but to be more aware that the GP is pestering them slightly more about their own responsibilities for their own bodies and their own health rather than just you know listening sympathetically and doling stuff out which is can sometimes be why we love them quite so much well thank thank you panel very much um, uh, we've rather strayed from the original question but what more could you expect of gps politicians and others um, however um, i do remember tony blair um, on a, a stage like this a few years ago uh, talking about whether you could put the NHS in the oven and how often you had to open the oven door and see how it was getting on. I didn't quite understand what he's going on about, but I think it's something to do with the fact that people will be watching CCGs and they will certainly be up for review, even if not up for change. Now, uh, we're going to finish by seeing how you vote on those questions that we asked you right at the beginning. So, in fact, just the one question. This is the one question. Uh, do you think CCGs will undergo major reorganization in the next five years? That's to say, have the panel given us the answers and the reassurance that we need to absolutely guarantee that your answer is going to turn uh, from naught very unlikely to 100% very unlikely? Let's see how well the panel have done. Votes on pads, five seconds, five, four, three, two, one. Ah, well, goodness me. Um, uh, do you think this? So, so, so very likely. Uh, has there been a change? What's been the change? It's got worse. It's got worse. <laughs> okay, fine. Um, well, thank you, panel, for your uh, excellent advice. You've uh, clearly, certainly reassured everyone here today. Um, I, uh, I will continue to fight against the reorganization of CCGs. Uh, uh, five or six of us, I'm sure, will try very hard to do so. Um, I look forward to meeting again in two or three years to see if your uh, pessimism has uh, actually happened to uh, be brought about. But uh, let's finish the conference by thanking very much our very excellent panel. And that concludes the commissioning show for this year. I hope you have good travels home and come back next year. Thank you.